<laughs> Hi everyone, Anthony Fantano here, the best teeth in the game, and the internet's busiest music nerd, in for another edition of Let's Argue, where I go on the internet, I ask you for your unpopular opinions, your hot takes, your tough questions. I respond to the best ones, literally, right here, right now. <laughs> Let's go. Podcasts are quickly overtaking music in terms of what people relate over, listen to, and what gets people through their day to day. I agree that podcasts are a popular medium and that they're good and entertaining and people enjoy them and there's a culture around podcasts that podcast fans share in. However, the numbers aren't really there in terms of podcasts overtaking music in terms of what people listen to for enjoyment. For one, podcasts aren't even really in competition with music. They provide an entirely different experience, and there are actually quite a few podcasts out there that are just about music. Furthermore, the numbers aren't really there. If there were nearly as many podcast fans and listeners as there were music fans out there, and I realize there are quite a few, podcasting would be a multi-billion dollar industry. And look, I get that podcasting has come a long way. People like Joe Rogan make millions of dollars off of their podcasting brand, and that there is way more infrastructure today with podcasting than there used to be. It's a tough thing to argue, mostly because the premise is so unbearably silly to begin with. Acting as if podcasting and music are in competition with each other on top of it, humans have been making music for thousands and thousands of years now. The idea that we'd suddenly give up listening to and maybe even creating music just because we created technology that allows us to hear one asshole talk to another asshole for two hours is stupid. There are no good songs about food. MF Doom has a whole album about food, and a lot of those songs are pretty good. But why does this even preoccupy your mind? There really aren't that many songs directly about a food item to begin with. Whenever a food is mentioned in a popular track, it's, it's usually more as a metaphor or a piece of symbolism. Is Schoolboy Q's Collard Greens really about collard greens? Is System of a Down's Chop Suey really about Chop Suey? The Beastie Boys' Eggman, is it really a song? song about a man of egg. Either that or you'd have to believe that Warren's cherry pie is literally about a cherry pie. Baby Metal Slaps. I mean, it's pretty good. For me in small doses mostly, but it's it's fine. It's decent. What's interesting now is you have a lot of Western pop stars that are starting to incorporate heavy metal and new metal into their sound, and they're doing it in a pretty innovative way, and I wonder if that will make baby metal be a bit more creative with how they do it with their stuff into the future just to keep up. Victoria Justice technically made Ariana Grande with her show. Yeah, but I mean, Ariana is not the first pop artist to have been in television or in something else before breaking into the music industry or making a name for herself in the music industry. Look at Justin Timberlake, look at Britney Spears, uh, both, I think, alumni of the Mickey Mouse Club. So nothing entirely new, not a new thing. It is what it is. Uh, lots of actors and actresses and uh, artists of different stripes try to transition over into music. Uh, most fail, most utterly fail, uh, but some succeed, and when they do, um, I guess they, they do, they succeed. It Came From Bandcamp is one of your least appreciated endeavors. I find that you enjoy and understand micro genres much better just through perusing the site and it exposes a lot of great underground artists. A revamp of the show with perhaps a sharper focus would be welcomed. Yeah, I have no idea how to revamp It Came From Bandcamp or even reviewing your music in a way where you guys actually give a shit about it or as much of a shit you tell me you give about, hey, uh, review un unsigned artists. Hey, talk about unsigned music. Hey, review about artists I don't know about. But when I talk about artists nobody knows about and I review your music and I do a It Came From Bandcamp, you guys barely watch it. So I, I really don't know what to do at this point. I mean, of course, if an album falls into my lap and nobody knows what the hell it is, and I think it's great and I think it's amazing, uh, of course I'm going to review it because that just keeps me sane. You know what I mean? But I would love to be in a place <laughs> where, you know, when I do eventually decide to make that jump and just take that time to, I'm going to talk about this even if I know it's not going to get the most views in the world, uh, that when I do, you know, make that uh, decision, I would like you guys to see it. Not just because, oh, you know, views are good for me, but also it's, it's really awesome to be able to give a bit of a boost to a piece of art that I think is really cool. Because unfortunately in our current commercial 
music, economy, capitalist uh, dichotomy, so on and so forth, uh, the success, or rather the likelihood that you will continue making music is highly dependent on how much money you're able to make off of your music. So. Uh, yeah, I wish there were more people in my audience that were excited to see me give a positive review to something that they don't know than give a negative review to something that they know. I know just wishing for that to be the case is, is not going to change it, but that is my wish. Album art needs to evolve. It's 2019 and we still have still images as album art. Wouldn't it be cool to have GIFs as album covers or customizable album art on streaming platforms? I'm pretty sure Anamanaguchi has already done the GIF thing as, as a single cover with which they put out like a, a one of those like you know little little holographic uh, images where you can kind of twist it and turn it and see it moving. So already slightly been done, but on top of it, I think there is a lot of utility and power in the potential of a still image. Not so sure I want to go into my favorite streaming service or into uh, whatever I listen to my own downloaded music on and just be hit with a fucking wall of moving gifts in front of my face. My eyes will glaze over and I will want to die. You know, while I'm not averse to artists, you know, popping in with a, uh, a moving image here and there, I would hate for that to be the norm. 4-4 time is overrated as shit. I don't see it that way. I think 4-4 time is pretty versatile. Yeah, sure, most songs are in 4-4, but come on, man. You could literally do almost anything in 4-4. You can come up with grooves that sound like insane, off-kilter, totally odd time signature grooves in 4-4. Just look at Polyphia. There's so much you can do with 4-4. Sure, it's tried and true. Sure, it's nothing new, but... I don't know, neither is the chromatic scale and we're still using that shit. Logic will return to form on no pressure. <laughs> well, what can certainly be said is that he can really only go up from his last two albums. I cannot imagine Logic getting worse from here. So uh, by that virtue alone, I guess I can look forward to the new album. I'm looking forward to it. I'm really looking forward to it. It's going to be better. Album cohesion doesn't matter. And further stating, if an artist wants to create a work of seamlessly integrated tracks that are all of a piece, that approach is totally valid. Uh, but it isn't inherently better than just a random bunch of drastically different ideas put onto one record. Yes, of course, album cohesion doesn't matter in respect to merely being able to create a record that is enjoyable, that a lot of people will like. Not totally necessary. However, is it nice? Mm, it's nice. However, there are multiple things that can make a listen to an album cohesive. Even if stylistically you're jumping all over the place, maybe the singer has a very distinct voice. Maybe in the case of a Ween or a Mr. Bungle, the lack of stylistic cohesion across the record is that cohesion. Ooh, it's all so random. That's a concept. Now, if you want a record where all the songs reinforce each other in a really powerful way so that the end of the record reaches a climax and the whole thing feels like you're listening to a movie, it's a unified experience that uh, really just builds on top of itself as it progresses. I would argue that more often than not, you have to have some elements of cohesion across the record if you want the listener to have that experience, and, and that can be a pretty powerful experience. Obviously not the only way you can make an enjoyable record, but still a powerful experience. Did Cotton Eye Joe pave the way for Old Town Road? No, that one Nelly song with Tim McGraw did and uh, that other weird rap song with LL Cool J about not being racist, uh, those did. Um, but not but not the Cotton Eye Joe song, no, not at all. It feels odd to put an album from 2010 as album of the decade. I knew it's still in the 2010s, but I feel like album of the decade would have to have some sort of culmination of influences surrounding the music of the decade, or some of it. In a way, that itself is reflective of the time period. I sort of agree with what you're saying here, but I can conceive an album that drops in 2010 that could potentially influence everything coming after it for the rest of the decade, so that album could very much define the sound of the decade in that way. I mean, let's look at 20... Yes. The Flaccavelli from Waka Flocka Flame. Uh, as much as Flocka has fallen off in popularity and relevancy over the years, uh, that album created a just damn break of trap. I think I just gave it away. Flaccavelli. 
Album of the Decade. People throw around the word incel too much these days, and it's quite depressing. A person is not an incel just because they write songs about unrequited love. A song can be a reflection of one's true emotions, loneliness and desire for a relationship are valid emotions. Yes, this is all true. My feelings on just uh, so casually throwing the word incel around to describe a song or uh, describe music, I think it can illustrate some attitudes and social trends uh, and, and be kind of funny here and there. But doing it so seriously and doing it so repeatedly, I think, can be dangerous for a few reasons. One, I think that it softens the uh, visuals or rather the, the optics of in seldom to normalize it in that unintentional way because when you actually know what incel culture is, the bone structure stuff, the self-hatred, the misogyny, the potential for violence, and a whole host of other things, uh, the whole black pill, everything, I feel like I'm talking about it way too much right here and right now. Look, if you look up any of this shit as a result of this video, let it be known, it's all just like made up shit do not buy into it. It's dangerous. It's destructive. It will crush your soul. It will depress you. It will ruin your fucking life if you buy into it. That is my warning to you. And that is one of my, again, concerns with just being like, oh yeah, that's incel. This is incel. That's the other thing. Because I think it displays a real ignorance to what the details of that culture online is. And I think it might make a lot of people who uh, could be called an incel feel like, oh, well, maybe maybe it's actually what I am and, and I should seek out people who also identify as this uh, for some kind of acceptance or understanding for the world and the way it works and why I feel the way I do. Uh, no, you should not do that. If you're somebody who can't get laid, if you're someone who can't get a date, which most people can't, I mean, just look at the statistics on millennials. Most millennials have a hard time and Zoomers as well, maintaining friendships, uh, much less romantic relationships. But again, I think calling stuff so casually incel, this is incel, that is incel, uh, can potentially do some harm in terms of spreading this ideology in a way uh, where societally, for the health of, of society, we, we might not want that to happen. I don't think dead artists should have a single verse slash album slash mixtape released after their death. While I am pretty, I guess I would say, conservative with the whole posthumous music thing, I wouldn't say I'm this extreme. Uh, especially in the case of, let's say, the new Gangstar record, where, of course, uh, DJ Premier has a better idea than most as to how a Gangstar song should sound, and I don't think there's a, there's a fan out there that would say that uh, Premier's adaptation of Guru's verses and the way he wove together the instrumentals, the guests he had onto the record, uh, that all of that didn't have a whole ton of heart and care put into it. That album deserved to come out. That was a record that fans deserve to hear. So of course there are gonna be instances where posthumous albums turn out really good. What I would just say, rule of thumb, going forward, if you're an artist listening to this, please, if you ever hit it big, even if you just end up you know, being uh, this fly-by-night, just sort of one-hit wonder, doesn't matter. As soon as you get some buzz and you're building a career and you're making money off of what you're doing full-time, talk to people around you, make it known. What do you want to be done with your music after you die? And how would you like to be presented to people if there's any leftover or anything like that? Because if you don't say that, there's a whole host of issues that can come about uh, as a result. And um, you, know, you, you, just don't, you just don't want to be in that situation where potentially your uh, legacy is ruined or blemished because of some music that came out that you maybe not would have wanted to come out. And I think that is going to be it for this episode of Let's Argue. Thank you very much for watching. Over here next to my head is another video that you can check out. Hit that up or the link to subscribe to the channel. Anthony Fantano, Let's Argue, forever.